Welcome back, guys. All right, so today we're going to be learning about Ireland. This video, quick history of Ireland. This is Europe, and this is the island of Ireland, and here's the Republic of Ireland. Now let's go, shall we? Green, isn't it? Indeed, it's not known as the Armored Isle for nothing, and the story of Ireland begins as shivering figures first stepped ashore during the waning days of the Ice Age. For many a century they lived as hunter-gatherers, feasting on salmon and chestnuts, until someone figured out the ground was really good and started growing stuff. Ireland then entered into that puzzling phase so many ancient cultures around the world stepped into, that of building big things. The most famous island Irish big thing is that rotund riddle known what as is that? Range. Built around 3200 BC, long before the pyramids, there's scores of theories as to its possible purpose, but this whopping circuit mound of earth and stone remains a mystery. During the Bronze Age, Ireland fell under the influence of the Beaker culture, but those days are still too inscrutable for us to understand and are yet another long mist shrouded enigma. Things get a little clearer in the Iron Age, which coincided with the arrival of the Celts, whose presence becomes increasingly distinct after the 300 BC mark. It was the Celtic people who forged the culture and consciousness of Ireland, as well as its language, and the country's name, Era, derives from a Celtic goddess, Eru. Anyway, Celtic Ireland was not a unified state, but instead an assortment of rival regions called Tuha, ruled over by chieftains. Again, however, not much is known of those times, as the Irish had no writing, and there seems to have been something of a dark age, concurrent with the centuries of Roman occupation of Britannia next door. Now, while this island of Britain would inflict... So they had no writing. What did they mean? Go back. The Irish had no writing, and there seems to Tuha, ruled over by chieftains. Again, however, not much is known of those times, as the Irish had no writing, and there seems to have been something of a dark age, concurrent with the centuries of Roman occupation of Britannia next door. Now, while this island of Britain would inflict a lot of misery on Ireland in the future, the Irish were among the peoples who invaded and ravaged British settlements in the closing days of Roman rule. Little did those Irish pirates know how their raids would alter their island forever. For one day in the 400s, they captured a Christian teenager and brought him to Ireland as a slave. Some years later, he escaped, but after a vision beckoned him back, he returned. Of course, this was the famous St. Patrick, and his years of preaching saw Ireland effectively Christianized. He became the patron saint of Ireland, and his feast day is celebrated around the world. And see, I always question when when they say Christian, like any area. I have a map up here. If you see every single area. World, typically in a very unsaint like manner with Ireland and his feast day is celebrated around the world actively Christianized he became the okay um Christianity means different things in different countries so yeah that doesn't tell me anything at all patron saint of Ireland, and his feast day is celebrated around the world, typically in a very unsaint like manner. Yes. With the uh. cross came literacy and the Latin alphabet, and the Irish began writing down and preserving their wonderful old legends. During the chaotic age of migration and invasion that accompanied the fall of the Western Roman Empire, many priceless texts were copied and kept safe by Irish monks in remote locales, like this island of sharp, craggy, rugged rock known as Skellig Michael, and what marvels of artistic craftsmanship they were. In 795, Vikings began looting around the Irish coast, and the 800s found them setting up permanent fortified settlements. If the Norsemen hoped to one day reign over all Ireland, that dream was shattered in 1014, when the forces of King Bri and Boruva, Brian Boru, defeated them at the Battle of Clontarf, but a cloud crept closer to Era, and a century after- Crazy, like when, when I watch it, these type of things, like man, it just- Oh, but really- Think about it, it it feels like it was just around the corner in twenty four. This was some of it was in the four hundred. So when they started mar that's just that's crazy.
after the French Viking Normans had conquered England, they set their sights on Ireland. Norman boots squelched ashore in 1169, and the trouble and tension between England and Ireland begins in earnest at this point. The Normans built castles and brought English law, but wholeheartedly adopted Irish ways and became so Irish that, to ensure their progeny's names weren't lost in the... Up in the morning to you. I probably did not. At all. So is that something that is said every day? Like, do people hear that every day? That's because mo how Americans do it. They say, hey, how are you? Um, guessing that's top of the morning. I don't know. Top of the morning. Uh, I don't even actually know. The Celtic genetic tide, they adopted Gaelic surname indicators like Fitz, as in Fitzroy or Fitzgerald. Now, English rule over Ireland was Gerald. far from absolute. They did not rule over all of it and constantly fought against the Irish. And after the Black Death of the mid 1300s, English territory was reduced to the greater Dublin area. After a rebellion in the 1530s, England's Henry VIII decided to reassert English control. So the next conquest of Ireland commenced, and the Irish were not happy about it. An armed resistance led by Hugh O'Neill saw the vicious Nine Years' War. In which the English triumphed and went on to impose their authority over all Ireland. The fiercely Catholic Irish resented this Protestant English intrusion and were only infuriated the more by the English crown pinching Irish land and putting Protestants in it. These were called plantations, and the biggest and most important one was located up in the Ulster region, which is where today's Northern Ireland is found. Persistent discrimination roused Irish anger, or ire you might say, which erupted in rebellion in 1641, led by Phelim O'Neill. Catholics made rapid gains, though many couldn't help themselves and attacked and slaughtered Protestant settlers. The Irish Confederate Wars ensued. I didn't catch all that, but it seemed a little baby. In 41, led by Phelim O'Neill, Catholics made rapid gains, though many couldn't help themselves, and attacked and slaughtered Protestant settlers. The Irish Confederate Wars ensued, a fervid, ferocious follow-up, in which the English intensified their efforts at reasserting their rule. How? They sent Oliver Cromwell. The future Lord Protector arrived in Ireland and proceeded to mercilessly crush all Catholic resistance. Seeing his mission oh. as one of righteous retribution, Cromwell's forces conquered and massacred, and to this day his name brings revulsion and disgust into every Irish heart. The war ended with hundreds of thousands of Irish deaths and tens of thousands shipped across the sea to toil in the new world as indentured labourers. So the Protestants maintained control of Ireland, but grew nervous when the Catholic James II became King of England in 1685. As religious tensions in Britain accumulated, James's Protestant daughter Mary and her Dutch husband William were invited to usurp the throne in the born. glorious revolution. That's funny. I had, um, apparently, I had a relative named Orange. I don't know what last name would be, but he ended up hit by a train. Wait, but I, that's kind of a cool name, and I've never heard that name in my life. Oh. James maintained control in Ireland, however, and planned to regain Britain from it. But in the subsequent war, James and his followers, the Jacobites, failed to defeat William's forces. And after losing the Battle of the Boyne in 1690, the Protestant dominance of Ireland was re-established. The Catholic Irish were by far the majority population, but they were mostly impoverished, disenfranchised peasants who were not allowed a say in the government of their own land. The miseries multiplied with a time of frost, followed by drought, which caused the Blian and Oith famine of the 1740s. That saw hundreds of thousands of Irish dead from disease and starvation. In 1798, inspired by the American Revolution and seeking reforms, the Society of United Irishmen led another rebellion against British rule, which the British quashed before passing the Acts of Union, whereby Ireland officially became part of the United Kingdom. The Irish people, however, still... Union, whereby Ireland officially became part of the United Kingdom. The Irish people, however, still lacked political rights. But thankfully, a man arose to champion their cause. Daniel O'Connell, a phenomenal public speaker who, with the support of the Catholic clergy, whipped up a massive popular movement that succeeded in getting Parliament to pass the Relief Act of 1829, which allowed Catholics into Parliament and scrapped a lot of old anti-Catholic laws. Finally, things were looking up for the Irish and, oh, wait, no, they weren't. The potato had gradually attained a state of dietary preeminence 
famines in Ireland, and the country became ominously dependent on that vegetable. In 1845, a disaster struck that altered the nation forever. A plant disease called blight infected Ireland's potato crop, rendering the cankered spuds useless for sale or consumption. It wasn't long before there wasn't any food at all to be had in many places, and hunger increased, and disease set in, and all this, coupled with calamitous mismanagement of the country's affairs, saw the abhorrent advent of Ngorta Mor, the Great Famine. A million people died. Understandably, emigration surged. Ships packed with Irish folk set off for Liverpool, Canada, Australia, and the United States. And today, well over 30 million Americans are of Irish descent. Even more understandable was the Irish struggle for reforms to help fix their dejected country. And over in America, the Irish had not forgotten their homeland, but zealously fought for Ireland and its freedom from British rule, as the Irish themselves successfully pushed for land ownership for native farmers against their absentee landlords. But no amount of reformatory signatures could stifle the cries for home rule, for self-government within the United Kingdom. But no such cries issued from the prosperous Protestant Northeast, which loved Britain and dreaded being ruled from Dublin. In any case, home rule was approved in 1914, but delayed by the First World War. Self-government, whilst still being joined to Britain, repulsed the radical Irish, who wanted total republic independence. And in 1916, members of the Irish Republican Brotherhood sparked an uprising in the capital. The British crushed the rebellion and had 16 of the leaders, including poet Patrick Pearce, executed. This made them martyrs, and people sympathised more than Never with the rebels, and the 1918 elections saw the radicalized pro-Republic Party Sinn Féin score a landslide victory. They soon declared Irish independence, and the British said, okay, fine. Just kidding, this is history, of course there was war, a time of fire and assassination. Finally in 1921, an agreement was reached, and the upshot of it all was the North East choosing to remain in the United Kingdom as Northern Ireland, and the rest gaining independence as the Irish Free State, though it was still part of the British Empire. And those Irish who opposed the treaty said, okay, fine. Just kidding, this is history, of course there was war. The Irish Civil War was won by those who favoured the treaty, though they'd handily received British military support. In 1937, the Free State of Ireland Ireland simply called itself Ireland, and at last, in 1949, it broke away from the British Commonwealth and officially became a republic. And under Chan Lamas, a number of beneficial reforms were introduced, and the economy began seeing big improvements, and in 1973, Ireland joined the future EU. An economic slump was followed by the Celtic Tiger boom of the 1990s, which was followed by a recession in the late 2000s, which was followed by a remarkable recovery in who knows what's next. In any case, Ireland today is ranked among the richest nations in the world, with a very high level of human development, despite the fact that those developed humans tend to drink a bit too much. Anyway, Ireland's transformation from pitiable poverty to prodigious pecuniary profusion really is astounding, and so are the achievements of the Irish people, who, while they've done some great things in, say, science or sport, it is in the creative spheres that the Irish have always excelled, producing some of the world's greatest writers, as well science or sport, it is in the creative spheres that the Irish have always excelled, producing some of the world's greatest writers, as well as many musical marvels. And musical marvels, and Ireland has won Eurovision more than any other country. And I was going to make another alcohol joke, but I don't want any booze. <laughs> Won't get it, booze. Okay, I'm out of here. Bye-bye! They do like their drinking, and Guinness is not good. I don't think it I don't know anybody that drinks drinks it. Actually, it's sold here, but yeah, it just seems really thick and really flavorful. Put it that way. I learned a lot from that video. I really enjoyed that, and I hope you guys did too. Um, don't forget to subscribe if if you haven't subscribed. I noticed that a lot of people, a lot of my viewers are not subscribed to my channel so take a moment like and subscribe comment i would appreciate it and catch you in the next video bye guys